I'm here in my living room and there are two bookcases here. And I used to have way more than these. Actually, in my previous uh, rectory, I used to have at least, I think, six or eight bookcases, all from Ikea, filled to the brim with books. Today, nowadays, these shelves are almost entirely empty. And in this episode of The Walk, I wanna talk about how I got rid and why I got rid of 95% of my books. Let's go for a walk. It is now about 10 months since I moved into this former rectory in uh, the little town of Bennekom and so much has changed. Uh, the parish is currently renovating uh, part of their, their, their meeting spaces. So they tore down the back of uh, the adjacent building next to the rectory and they're currently working with a lot of volunteers to expand it and make a bigger meeting room. So that makes a, a lot of noise, but I still, I don't mind because I'm so happy that I finally live in my own place now. And I remember that when I moved in, in October last year, I uh, met the previous, one of the previous occupants of the house who came over. He doesn't live here in this town anymore. In fact, he, he is deceased now, but uh, back then he was, he was ill. And he told me that he had to move because of that illness. And one of the things that he told me, because I showed him a little bit uh, what I'd done with the house, was that it was so empty compared to when he lived there. And he admitted that he was a bit of a hoarder. He had just so much stuff that he just couldn't part with. And when he had to move out, um, they had to bring in, I think, six trucks and he was moving to a much smaller apartment so he didn't even have space in his new place to store all that stuff so he had to, he had to get rid of a lot of it and uh, uh, this is probably also one of the reasons that the house was in a very bad state when I uh, when I first uh, visited it because there was just too much in it there wasn't room for any renovations uh, it, it was just basically he was constantly busy arranging his clutter and so let's go this way let's go to the left uh, this is a small park near where I live it's a beautiful day the Sun is shining and uh, there is a busy road normally I walk alongside that road but I try to make little detours to be more in you know a natural environment uh, there small houses here where people live um, and this is one of my favorite spots to start to start my walk so I know that moving from one place to another is a huge uh, challenge uh, because I've moved myself several times I think four or five times in the past ten years I had to move from my first parish to Rome then moving back from Rome after a couple of years back to the Netherlands and then I went from one rectory in the city of Amersfoort to a, a rectory in the same parish but in a smaller village and then as you know I moved from that village to this town and every time I had to move all my stuff and it is during those uh, <laughs> those weeks that and sometimes even months that I spent on on packing my stuff that I realized how much I had and how most of all the first time I moved I realized that I think like 60 or 70 percent of my stuff consisted of books books are heavy books are uh, cumbersome if you put them in boxes and you have to lift them up that's when you that's when you literally feel how how much they weigh you down and what I mostly had to uh, acknowledge, and that was a bit of a shocker, was that of all those books, and we're talking like the first time I moved, probably like 30 cases full of books that I'd only read maybe 95% of those books. So 95% of the books that I owned, I never opened them. I had bought them, most of them secondhand, 
So that was always the rationale. Uh, like these are on sale or this is a discount, this is second hand, nobody else will read them and they're gonna be, they're gonna end up in a landfill so I might as well just buy them. But only 5% of the books were books that I had read and then of the 95% of other books, um, there maybe was an additional 5% of books that I actually still wanted to read. And all the rest, they were just sitting there. And I, I, I don't get me wrong, I love books. I love the smell of books. I love the touch of books. I grew up almost at the library. That was my, my second happy place. Um, the first one being my hobby room where I would make little model aircrafts and later on uh, little Star Wars model kits. But I love to spend time among the books in the library. And, and there was something, I don't know, something peaceful being surrounded by all that knowledge. And I think that uh, one of the reasons that I was keeping all those books was to um, basically recreate that feeling of peace, of safety, a bit of nostalgia also of my childhood. And the thing is, it's... I'm keeping all that stuff that makes it so hard to move from one place to another just for the sake of nostalgia? Is that really worth it? And that's where I had to ask myself, well, maybe it is time to get rid of at least part of that book collection. And uh, that didn't go very well the first time. I think I got rid of a couple of boxes and then I, I put most of the books in storage when I went to Rome. Obviously, when I moved to Rome, I couldn't take all the, any of those books with me, nor would that have any meaning. <laughs> it's uh, one of my parishioners honking at me from his car. Um, and one of the, one of the, uh, the good things of, of going to Rome was that I was there for a specific purpose. I was going to do a study in social communications and so I just needed books about that all the rest I just wouldn't have time for it and then I noticed in Rome that I actually didn't miss any of those books I had lived there for more than two years without ever even thinking of any of the books that I had in storage and so when it was time to unpack everything when I was uh, getting my first parish in, in Amersfoort I, I realized that I had way too much and uh, I, that's, that, what, that helped me to get rid of a few more books. Uh, so I donated a, a lot of these books to the seminary so other students could benefit from those books and hopefully <laughs> they were useful and it felt liberating. And so when I moved again from one rectory to another, I did it again. I got rid of a ton of uh, additional books and uh, again, never ever looked back, never missed any of those books. And then when I moved here, that was kind of the final, <laughs> the, the final straw, the, the final push that I needed. Um, and, and that's where I made a more more structural resolution. I was like, I am only going to keep the books that are, that are, that really need to be paper books. So anything else, anything that I can read in a digital form, uh, I'm just gonna get rid of it. And I'm just keeping like, like I have this, this fairy tale book that I remember from my youth, my parents would read stories from that before bedtime. And it's a beautifully illustrated book. It is, this would not translate well into an ebook. And so, of course, I want to keep that. I have some, some uh, bigger, like, coffee table books where it's all about the, the big illustrations and the beautiful quality of the, of the paper. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to get rid of those uh, also because I actually like to, to read those books from time to time. So I'm keeping those. But just regular textbooks, even study books, you know, why, why not just get rid of them? And despite that, despite getting rid of most of my, uh, of, of, of my remaining books, I still had 
two trucks of stuff to move it here. And then of course we had to put that in storage for about eight months while we were renovating uh, the house. And yeah, uh, I'm so glad that, uh, that I got rid of all those books. Now, we're almost heading into the woods. Uh, I wanna take a little break and then I want to share with you what Jesus says actually about, well, not about hoarding books, but about hoarding other stuff. So here I'm turning to the right and I'm gonna follow this lane where ultimately I'll end up in, in the woods. I love this in the morning, especially the sun is shining through the leaves. It's still relatively cool, even though it is summertime, it's gonna be a very hot day, but I love the, the small houses, the almost like hobbit-like cottages here in the area. It is a wonderful place. And, and this is just one street away from where I live. I feel so privileged that I live in such a beautiful, uh, calm neighborhood. So the reason that I bring up this topic is that not so long ago, I had to preach about uh, the gospel where Jesus talks about uh, this guy, or he actually tells a story about this guy who um, has had a fantastic harvest and he's got so much grain, so much food that it's more than he needs and probably also more than he can sell. And, and so he decides to build this huge barn and he spends a lot of resources on creating a bigger barn and probably also tearing down his existing barn and stock, stockpiling all that grain for the future. And then once that work is done, he sits back and relaxes and tells himself, dude, you did a terrific job. I'm paraphrasing, of course, Jesus didn't say dude. <laughs> But uh, it's like, okay, I, I, you're, you're good. You can relax now. You, you have everything you need. Now enjoy. Get some, something to drink. Eat some. Enjoy. Live your life. And then Jesus adds a warning. He says, poor guy. Do you know that actually tonight God is going to bring you over to the next life, you will die. And then all this stuff that you stockpiled, who is it for? You know, what are you gonna do with it? You can't take it with you. And I think that is, that is that, that I think characterizes Jesus' own attitude towards possessions. We know that he didn't have anything. He was walking with his apostles. Uh, oftentimes you see Jesus ask his friends for food. Do you have something to eat? Uh, or other people invite him to come over for dinner. Uh, here is, by the way, here's the entrance to the forest. And there is an angry dog here that uh, really wants him to go away. <laughs> That's a good guard dog. So a lot of the houses here uh, have uh, dogs. And it's also probably because this is a bit of a remote part of the town. Uh, so there's not much traffic well there is traffic because there's a there's a road on my right uh, but there are not that many people walking around here so this is more prone to burglaries and, and that's probably why a lot of people have dogs this is also why I encounter so many dogs when I'm recording my shows here in the woods um, they're out here to play and it's, of course, intriguing to see this priest walking around with a, a microphone. And sometimes I have my wind cap, which looks a bit like an animal. <laughs> it's a bit like, they call it a dead cat, actually, to muffle the, the wind noise. I don't have that on my phone. Um, so I'm recording this on my phone right now. And so every once in a while, you may hear some wind noise. I'll work on, uh, on fixing that in the future. But anyway, uh, what was I saying? I'm totally off track now. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, so what, what always strikes me is that we never hear that Jesus um, 
you know, took care of his belongings or fed his horses or anything. Um, it, it comes across, we, we know that Jesus has actually lived in a, in a small town for several years, so I bet you know, that he had a house or maybe he stayed with friends. But most of the time, he's on the road and other people take care of him. And that gives you, of course, a certain freedom, a certain, you know, detachment, which for Jesus was not just uh, a life hack to not have to worry about stuff, but it expressed his relationship with his father. For him, the most important thing in his life was the love and is the love of his father. And that is enough for eternity. In fact, that will also be the case for us because we are not destined to live here for the rest of eternity. Even though I, I love living here, it's, <laughs> it's not that, but we know that our true destination is in heaven. And so in heaven, we, we won't have books. We won't have stuff. Uh, we don't need to worry about our car payments or uh, loans or, or, or whatever. Um, people won't be... Uh, robbing you there were there won't be any burglars <laughs> so you don't need to have a dog to 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 guard your little cloud in heaven um, we, we, I don't know if we maybe we'll have dogs in heaven but it will just be for the joy of <laughs> sharing life together but the, the the fact is Jesus already lived his life here on earth as if in the same way actually as he lived it with his father and with the Holy Spirit in that eternal trinity and so for him it was fundamental not to put any value in things and he, he makes it even more explicit at one point he tells his uh, his followers people that actually are expressing their their desire to follow him he warns them he says well you know what the the the, the birds have their nests animals have their <laughs> little you know places where they can be safe but the son of man doesn't even have a stone to rest his head upon uh, something to that to that extent and so uh, for him part of being a follower consists in um, letting go of your possessions and he challenges his uh, his followers to not look back to just drop whatever they're doing to leave their families their job their former life and to just go with him and to trust that God will provide. And there's something I think beautiful about that. Uh, it, it's a, and this is, this is why um, if, I, if I try to apply that to my own life, I feel this constant challenge to not hang on to stuff for the sake of stuff or because it gives me a nice feeling to be surrounded by books. Uh, after all, in the end, books are mostly a tool, a tool to acquire wisdom. Uh, the, the Bible itself, the stories that we read in the Bible, originally weren't even written down. Uh, the Bible stories, including the New Testament, except for uh, the letters that St. Paul and some of the other uh, writers uh, sent to young communities, but most of the contents of the of the gospel is a written down version of what originally was an oral tradition. These stories were sometimes told from generation to the next generation before they got written down. That is also why there are so many historical inconsistencies in the Bible and points where you're like, well, hmm, is that really what happened, or is this an interpretation? what happened in a, in a totally different time. Um, that is all part of an oral tradition. But what I want to say is the Bible itself, <laughs> it's not enough to have the book. Um, what's most, much more important is that you get to know these stories, that you listen to these stories, that you read them, that you, you, you process them. What good is it to have a Bible in your house on a bookshelf only to show off that you're pious and that you're a Bible reader. <laughs> that, that's not how it works. Uh, if you have a Bible, you have to make sure 
that you read it. I actually, I like it when I sometimes visit friends and they have Bibles where th there are tons and tons of little colored paper, p bits of paper or post-it notes sticking out of the, of the Bible. And you open it and the pages are, are, um, are smudgy and uh, sometimes people use their colored markers. I, I don't think I can ever do that because I respect books too much. But they use colored markers to... Uh, highlight certain phrases or passages that they like. They scribble in the in the margins their thoughts, um, and and I think for me that's an example. I I hope that I can ever get to that point where I can also kind of let go of that idea that a book is a sacred thing that needs to be preserved and cannot be blemished in any way. Uh, but these people show me that. It's all about the reading. It's all about the processing. Uh, it's what you do with the story that matters. If, if it's just there to show off or because it's such a nice looking Bible, then yeah, it's, it's probably a sign that you should get rid of it, even though it, it is a Bible. If you don't read it, what good is it? I hear an airplane. <laughs> I don't know. There's always something that I, that I associate with summertime, hearing these propeller airplanes going overhead. <laughs> Take a look at this. Uh, from what I've heard, this is actually a sign that this tree is doomed. Uh, even though it looks healthy, it's very tall, it's got leaves, it's probably too close to the other trees here. And so they marked it for, well, deletion. And they're gonna cut this tree off to make room for other trees. So this tree may actually end up becoming a book <laughs> because, well, at least not an e-book, but it's definitely one of the uh, future possibilities for, for trees is to end up in your hands in the, in the form of a book or a, or a magazine. Um, yeah, th this is a poor uh, fellow, uh, and another tree that has already been, um, uh, how is it, demolished? What do you do with trees? You, you, <laughs> you tip it over. But in fact, they, they are leaving it here in the forest uh, because th this entire uh, part of the woods is managed by a uh, uh, nature organization. And so they, they oftentimes will just leave the, 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 the trees in the forest to decompose because it then can become a source of food for insects, uh, for wildlife. And uh, so the, the, this, the, these woods are much, much more messy uh, than, let's say, 20 years ago when the policy was more like, OK, we uh, take down trees and we remove them from the forest. Nowadays, especially when I go here for walks or runs, I will often come across these half decomposed uh, uh, trees. And then uh, that, that serves, of course, as compost is that the word as as uh, uh, fertile ground or fertile what is it material for for the rest of the of the forest Ooh, look at that <laughs> it's not a snake but it is definitely well actually it is a snake oh my gosh Look at that, it's a snake, a tiny one. When I saw it, I, I just thought it was a huge worm, but it is actually a tiny little snake. And I think his, oh, he's, he's, he's hurt, he's damaged. So his tail is, uh, is severed, I think. So he's got a bit of trouble moving around. This is the first time ever that I've seen a snake in these woods. So what did I do? Now that I've gotten rid of 95% of my books, does it also mean that I'm not reading anymore? In fact, I, I did something much more useful and I'm still so glad. Uh, I've been doing this for, for two, three years now. I'm so glad that I made that decision. Instead of taking pride in my collection of books, and I often put it in the background when I was doing my, my streams, my live streams. I love to show off my book collection in the background. Instead of taking pride in 
uh, having this massive collection of books that I actually never read, I decided to put my pride into a reading list. I started to uh, set myself goals at the beginning of each year, because, well, why not? Beginning of each year is always a good time for, for, for resolutions. But instead of uh, making resolutions that I would never really keep or not keep for more than a month, I, I set myself the resolution of reading a certain number of books in that particular year. I, I think I started with uh, something like 25 books. And, and, and so I forced myself to read a book every two weeks, which was so hard because I had completely lost the habit of reading. Um, when I was a child, I would easily read two books per, per week. Um, and it was also because I just had a lot of time. I, I was a pretty fast sh student, so I had usually a lot of time to spare for my hobbies. And so I did read a ton of books. Uh, but for years, I barely ever, ever I, since I finished my my studies, I um, I just I just stopped reading. And to get back into the habit of reading proved to be more difficult than I thought. But the thing is, having that list and ticking off these books, and I forced myself after reading a book to also write a review about it, and that is uh, mostly for myself. Because while writing that review, I take some time to think about how the book has impacted me. That's the purpose. A review is, is not just a description of, like, this is what's in the book. That, that's going to be on the cover of the book. Someone else can do that. Well, what is interesting for other people to know uh, is, what did I think of the book? Did it make a difference? Did, did I learn something from it? And that's what I try to write down in the book. And that helps me to also um, retain the information in the book a little bit better. And if I can't summarize it, hello. <laughs> if I can't summarize it in, um, in one, par one or two paragraphs, then it's probably not going to stick anyway. So uh, writing that review is both a way for me to process what I've read, to, take, to, to have at least one takeaway, and I can go back to those reviews at the end of the year and read through them, and I was like, oh, interesting, I, I, I forgot about that, or maybe I have to reread that book. And it can also help other people to uh, find out why uh, this is a book that they should read or, or avoid. <laughs> Let's be honest, that also happens. Sometimes you read a book and you're like, wow, that was, <laughs> that was a week that I never get back. Um, but it also has the additional benefit of making me feel like I, I, I accomplished something. That's another book that I read. And so I started to up the number of books that I wanted to read. Uh, the next year I, I read, I think, twice as much. This year I set myself the goal of reading 100 books, which is something I... If you told me that four years ago, that there would be a time... Uh, that I would read a hundred books in just one year, uh, I would have said no, no, no way. And yet, I'm doing it. I'm on track, and the way I do it is I read both uh, fr from my ebook, but I also listen to a lot of audiobooks, especially when I'm out for a run or a training walk. Um, I love to just go through those books because there's something. I, at least for me, it's probably not for everyone, but I love listening to someone narrating the book because it, uh, let's see if I can just follow this regular road or I can go in here, which is, I think, private property. At least there is this sign here. It says this is private property, but it is uh, available to people that want to walk here as long as you uh, don't take motorbikes or you have to leap put a leash on your dog and you can't be here after sunset. Well, there's plenty of sun today, so I, I guess I can just walk in here. Um, and this is just like the rest of the forest. <laughs> um, so, th but while r listening to these audiobooks and reading regular ebooks, um, I've noticed that I get for the, well, ever since I started doing that, books 
really have true value to me. Value because they teach me, they, they give me wisdom, they, uh, they inspire me. Uh, I read a lot of nonfiction, so I learn a lot about psychology, about uh, cosmology, you know, I love to read science books. Um, and I love when I read fiction, it also has a huge benefit of kind of uh, scratching that, that creative itch. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading stories and I'm transported to, to worlds that I've never explored before, but also to lives of fictional characters that have very different lives and make different choices, have different philosophies than I have. And that is... That is um, challenging and it, it, it makes me think and and even though I may not exactly share the values or or would would replicate the choices of the of the main characters there's still always something to be gathered because you are challenged to relate to what you read and so I would say that that books ever since I started to put my pride in my reading list instead of in my bookshelves Books have become one of the most important sources of inspiration in my life. Their value is as a thousand times bigger than the monetary value or the collectioner's value of those books when I still had them in paper form. That's what I wanted to share with you on this walk. If you are one of my patrons, then I am going to walk an extra mile. Um, and that will be made available to my patrons. So go over to patreon.com slash fatherroderick if you want to walk a little bit more with me. And if not, if that's impossible for you, it's not a problem. I'm already so happy with the privilege of your time. I hope this has been useful and inspiring to you. Let me know in the comments or on the website or on the Discord server if you're a patron or on, on social media. Let me know if, if, if this is something you can relate to. If you have too many books or, or maybe you disagree. Maybe you think, you know what, I love my books and there's no way in the world that I ever will read an e-book because. Let me know. And to wrap things up, uh, I'm always on the lookout for, for new books to read. Uh, I still have about 50 books to read until the end of the year. So if you have a book that you think I should absolutely read... Let me know. Thanks and talk to you next time.